and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnke, and as always, I'm here with Matt Stewart and Jess Perkins. G'day. G'day there, mateys. Hello, cobbers. <laughs> hey, cobs. Hey, bloody great to see you. <laughs> so good to be in your presence here today. <laughs> hey, quick question. Yeah. How bloody good is it to be alive? <laughs> well, I wish I was never born. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm true blue. <laughs> <laughs> hey, rip, rip, wood chip. <laughs> Turn it in the paper. Here we go. I regret starting this. She's me, you, and I'll keep it that way. Just say that Aussie phrase: razor blades, pizzeria, and I'm in. <laughs> and I'm I'm into the pizzeria. <laughs> a happy continuation of block. Ah, uh, what a block it's been so far. It's been maybe the biggest block of all time. Do you reckon? Hmm. I guess it depends on how you measure that. Yeah. How would we measure block? Uh, Block like, bigness. Let's just assume it is. It's yeah. vibe, I think, mainly. And yep. it can only get bigger and bigger each year, right? The vibe is as big as it's been. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. You can't see that at home, dear listener. But, but they uh, heard it, though. That, that was the loudest. Well that was the loudest. That was the loudest tissue <laughs> Matt, that's ever existed. I mean, the best bit is Matt going, it's the, yeah, the best vibe it's ever been. <laughs> Small lull as I, like, wipe my dripping nose. Oh, no. <laughs> the block, vi- block nose, member. <laughs> the vibe is huge. It would be the opposite of that, really, wouldn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Unblock vibe. Okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, but people don't know what block is, Jess, what is it? It is. Th- it's the- Oh, wow. I mean- <laughs> It's the most wonderful time of the year. What, that's what isn't it, is. it? You know yeah. what I mean? That, <laughs> like- <laughs> that is so well put as a question. <laughs> All right, no, start listening what it isn't. <laughs> it's not Christmas. Oh. Okay. It's not Valentine's Day. It's not um, but, Labor Day. But also it's all of those things. It's all of those things, <laughs> yet somehow none of them. Okay. Block is where our wonderful listeners vote on um, a bunch of topics. These are the most requested, most voted on topics. So they are always absolute blockbuster episodes. They're big stories. They're fun, wild, murdery sometimes. They can be anything, mm. but they're the most voted on. Um, and it's always, you know, it, it's supposed to be October. We've annexed November, and it's a beautiful time of year. October, November. Yeah. This is the block Topher Grace period. That's right. <laughs> it's blockbuster Toba. Mm-hmm. It's everything you want it to be and more. That's right. Whether you want it to be or not. <laughs> <laughs> and Jess is re- about to report on one of our most voted for topics of all time. Yeah, but I'm already puffed from trying to explain mm. what block is. Sorry, I forgot that you'd also have to be the one who does it. I should have really handballed that one to Matt. You Sorry about that. You're I doing, think I did really well. You're and, doing it all. Well, and you choosing to podcast on a treadmill, I think, is backfiring. <laughs> 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 Got to get my steps in. <laughs> Got a little walking pad under here. I'm walking. Yes, I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got a uh, topic um, to tell you all about today, and I have a question to get onto that topic. Fantastic. Matt and I, before we recorded, admitted that we've both forgotten what you're going to talk about, so this is a genuine answer. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we have, because obviously we had to, like, we, we tallied all the votes. We know yes. what the top numbers are. <laughs> I've got no idea. They're written down somewhere where we can all access it, yeah. and I haven't looked at it. Like, I never know what it's going to be. It's exciting, mm. but, yeah, it does mean this is still a surprise. Okay, here we go. Okay, the question is, Catherine Zeta-Jones. Wales. Michael Douglas. Rob Brydon. Wales. And Bonnie Tyler were all born where? Wales. Correct. <laughs> I'm going to stick with Michael Douglas. <laughs> It is Wales, specifically. Wait, what the- How did I get that right? Because <laughs> I said Catherine Dear Jones. Okay. Wow, yeah, that is still Wales. pretty incredible. Yeah, very impressive. I don't. I have n- no recollection of Wales being on Wales the list. is correct, but it's not the answer I was okay. looking for. <laughs> oh, Cardiff. No. Ooh. Can you name any other Wrexham. area in Wales? South Wales. North Wales. Old South Wales. Okay. You got, you got like- New South Wales. South Wales is, yeah, that's kind of correct. Let's think of like a um, a, a bird, like my dog's name is- Goose. Think of another a similar type of bird. Duck. Swan. Swansea. Swansea! <laughs> 
Matt Stewart with the win. <laughs> this has become like a free flowing, like whatever comes into your mind. Sort of. Well, it was a really hard question to write. Um, it wasn't the most relevant because um, this is a, por- a report about a famous murder in the general area oh, of Swansea. Okay, I was thinking Swansea made the top nine. <laughs> Incredible. What is this, the, the history of the Swansea Football Club? No, this is the sixth most voted for uh, topic for Block, and it's the Clidach murder. Oh, right. right. I, yeah, I'm glad so, you know, I would not have remembered that. I'm just looking it up. It had, oh, it only just snuck over the uh, last few weeks, 27.38% ooh, of the votes. I mean, I think our our um, listeners love murder. Yeah, they love um, murder. They love a bit of foul. mystery and intrigue. Mm. And this was actually suggested by um, one person from Swansea, a long-time listener, um, Sari John Jones. Oh yes, Kerry. John Kerry John Jones. Jones thank and you. Kerry gave Dave and I some cookies. Am I thinking of the right? Oh person? yeah, yeah. They were. Uh, is, is it cookies? Or what are, it's what? not cookies. It's a traditional it was some, Welsh. It was, I think ah. that would be the most brutal way to describe whatever they were. But they were fantastic. They were like Welsh. Welsh bunnies or something. You know, they would have had a, a fun name like that. Cool. Probably not bunnies, but. Yeah, Kerry John Jones, long time listener. Welsh, Welsh breakfast Welsh, cake? Welsh cakes. Welsh cakes. Well done. Bunnies was, to be honest, miles off. What'd you I call it? Cookies? You idiot. And they were delicious, and we ate them the next day for breakfast. We did while That's we were nice. going to see the Bristol clock with two different times on it. God, you guys know how to party. Bristol, and-, and Dave waited in the car while I ran and had a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get apart. <laughs> That's how in demand this clock is. So you thought, I'll just do some loops. You go have a look <laughs> yeah. for both of us. Yeah. <laughs> and don't worry, the cameras were rolling and eventually we will put out that uh, that tour video so people can <laughs> see that moment caught on film. Wow. Because it's like the clock is only like 15 or 30 minutes behind the route. 10. Oh, 10, 10 I think, minutes. I think it's like, 10. Why have- anyway, find out more about that in our upcoming travel documentary of Bristol. Can't wait. I won't be watching that. Anyway. But only one. So, Kerry's the only one who suggested this. Yeah. Incredible. And I think still- I suggested a while ago. But, yeah, it, Kerry's from Swansea. So, and it's quite a sort of, it's a famous story in Wales in particular, but obviously in this general area too. It's very well known. So, it got the, it got the votes probably based mainly on the word murders. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it is a really interesting case. Um, and I would love to tell you all about it if, if you don't mind. Please. <laughs> Do go on. So, at approximately 12.30 a.m. on Sunday, the 27th of June, 1999, 34-year-old Mandy Power got out of a taxi with her daughters, 10-year-old Katie and 8-year-old Emily, and walked up the steps to the front door of their home in Clitic, a village in Swansea in Wales. Four hours later, at 4.30 a.m., Robert Wachowski heard banging and smashing noises and looked out his bedroom window to see white smoke billowing from the rear of Mandy's house. Oh, my God, new Pope. I was also thinking new Pope. Does that mean new Welsh Pope? New Welsh Pope. You don't remember this, the Welsh Pope? He initially thought someone had set fire to a bag of rubbish and he grabbed the phone and called Mandy's landline. No answer, so he tried her mobile. But again... No answer. I love that, having your, your neighbours' numbers. Those I know. Those are their close-knit community letters. I've got no neighbours' phone numbers, and I like it that way. Oh, right. <laughs> that also dates this to 1999, calling the landline first. Yeah. Uh, and then the but mobile. And then the mobile. Mobile's- because there was only a brief time where you would call, you would even have both options. Yeah. And you'd call them in that order. Yeah. It was always landline first. and But also, like, it does make sense, I guess, doesn't it? Because a landline's going to wake up the whole house. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But then you might call through and be like, oh, someone's on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're on Netscape. They're ma- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Beautiful sounds. We're also showing our age by <laughs> having that nostalgia. So he can't get a through on the phone. I still have dial-up. <laughs> <laughs> he ran across the road, started banging on the front door, shouting for Mandy to wake up. Around the back of the house, he saw that the kitchen was aflame. Another neighbour, Donald Jones, had joined him outside now and the two men continued to bang on doors and shout and try to alert the occupants of the house. Another neighbour had called 999 and firefighters were quickly dispatched. The firefighters assumed they'd be dealing with a pretty straightforward house fire, um, but conflicting reports were coming in as to whether the occupants of the house were inside. They didn't know if anybody was home. or So shortly before the fire engine arrived, controllers confirmed that there was probably at least one person inside, Mandy's bedridden 80-year-old mother, Doris Dawson. Oh, They're no. like, chances are she hasn't popped out, so we, we reckon Doris is home. Because she's bedridden. Yes. Two Th- fire- that means just always in the bed. That's right. Sort of Grandpa Joe style. Yeah. 
Yeah, but give her a golden ticket. Give her a golden ticket to a chocolate factory. She's she's uh, clicking her heels out of there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more than ten firefighters had arrived, and uh, and they jumped into action. Um, the layout of the house was explained to them quickly by one of the neighbours. They said the stairs were just inside the front door on the right and the bedrooms were all upstairs. So Hugh Thomas, um, he's one of the firefighters, he explains in this documentary called Murders in the Valleys, which I – Murder in the Valleys, which I um, fall back on a lot because it's a really great resource for this story. So he's explaining that he kind of felt his way up the stairs on his hands and knees because it's so – the smoke is so thick you can't see. So the firefighters are sort of kind of crawling up the stairs. And as he reached the landing at the top of the stairs, he did a bit of a sweep of the floor in front of him with his arm and his hand swept over a body. Ooh. He realised it was one of the little girls. They oh. carried her downstairs and out of the house and tried to resuscitate her. Quickly after, the other child was found and then the mother, and for several long minutes, firefighters worked on the family giving CPR. A team of paramedics arrived within minutes and took over, although they could quite quickly tell that there was very little hope. Paramedic Barry Pierpoint later said it was quite obvious that very serious injuries had been sustained. All three of them had signs of serious head injuries and the paramedics were unable to save any of them. Right, it's not just the fire then. Yeah, that's oh, right. Jesus, I was really hoping that family were going to be the murderers. Yeah. That would- <sighs> family murderers, yeah, yeah. That would have been a fun story. One could only hope. <laughs> One of the firefighters, Neil McPherson, re-entered the house to search for any more casualties. By now the fire was somewhat under control and the smoke was less dense and in an upstairs bedroom he found the body of Doris Dawson still in her bed and she too had suffered facial and head injuries. Oh. It was incredibly clear to everyone present that this fire was no accident and that this family home was now a crime scene. Um, author John Morris, he wrote a book about this and uh, I, I use him a little bit as well. So he wrote, When Police Constable Alison Crewe arrived at Kelvin Road, she immediately realised the seriousness of the situation and radioed her senior officer, Detective Inspector, who was also on duty that night. The Detective Inspector was an experienced police officer and had been a member of the South Wales Police Force for more than 20 years. When he arrived at Kelvin Road, his seniority effectively placed him in charge of the crime scene. Police constables told him that the victims had not died as a result of the fire, but from injuries inflicted. Three of the bodies were still laid out on the lawn in front of the house. This was a multiple murder and demanded the highest level of priority and immediate action. But the house was still on fire and the crime scene was overrun by firemen whose primary concern was to make it safe and minimise risk rather than to preserve evidence for use in any future criminal proceedings. Mm, That's tricky. Now, as we said, the detective inspector, he's an experienced detective. He knew the steps needed to be taken in order to preserve evidence so that a criminal investigation could begin. But for reasons known only to him... The detective inspector took none of these steps and only spent about 10 minutes at the crime scene before leaving. I might have had plans. (laughs) At at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah, Yeah, I've got plans to go back to bed. Can this wait? (laughs) I mean, they're gone. I'll be back. (laughs) So a bit of further context here, again, from John Morris. So he writes... Between 1980 and 2000, South Wales Police gave an entirely new meaning to the expression trial and error. Of all the police forces in Britain, (laughs) South Wales Police had been responsible for some of the worst miscarriages of justice in the United Kingdom. By the time of the Clinic murder, no fewer than nine earlier murder investigations by the force had proved to be miscarriages of justice, and 19 people had been freed after being wrongly convicted of crimes they did not commit. Oh, wow. Is that because they turn up and they go get the vibe for about 10 minutes and go, (laughs) I reckon that guy did it. I'm going back to bed. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, so it's not, it's incompetence, not, they're not trying to, they just want to get it done and they don't care who they're putting away. Right, so not corruption, it's just incompetence, yeah. yeah. Is that right? Oh, it's good. Okay. Good about. Well, John goes on to say, had their trials been conducted before 1967 when the death penalty was abolished, those individuals would have been hanged. Whoa. So, there's 19 people wrongly convicted. Um, all hard, hard to undo that. Yeah. Many miscarriages of justice were caused by wrongdoing on the part of South Wales police detectives. Evidence was routinely altered and fabricated. In some cases, detectives wrote statements themselves and then forced suspects or witnesses to sign them. Is that because they got the vibe that they'd done it and they're like, 
It'll just be easier if you give us some evidence to prove this. Yeah. If you could just give us some evidence, that would actually make my job so much easier. I'll write the evidence. You just sign the evidence. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's my dad's birthday, so if you could just admit it now, yeah. I'll, get, I'll still I want to make- go back to bed. <laughs> I'll, still- <laughs> I'll still make it in time for cake after I've gone back to bed, <laughs> had a full day, and then <laughs> make yeah, it It's my dad's birthday tonight. In other cases, suspects were tortured, bullied, or simply worn down by lengthy interviews into making untrue confessions. Oh, wow. They were so bored they confessed to a murder. Like, oh, fuck this. I'm so bored. Vulnerable witnesses were leaned on to make false statements implicating an innocent person in a crime. Others were bribed, some intimidated. Prisoners serving time in jail were offered deals in return for signing false statements, and some detectives planted incriminating evidence where it was certain to be found to frame innocent suspects for crimes they hadn't committed. I'll say this about the Swansea police. Their methods were unique, but they got results. (laughs) (laughs) They sure did. Yeah, so it's a bit of it is in, a bit of incompetence. It is like uh, it's really more about like it looks good on them to get convictions to like arrest people to solve cases. So they just they got KPIs exactly right. So they just do that. But also, John Morris goes on to say, if framing an innocent person by police officers sworn to uphold the law was not bad enough, another custom that flourished within the ranks of South Wales police was equally corrupt. This was the sinister practice of watching one another's backs. It ensured that a fellow police officer would escape the consequences of wrongdoing, no matter how serious the misconduct or criminal their actions might be. So they also sort of covered each other up a lot. You'd have to get into a circle, otherwise, because it was just two of you. I could watch your back, but you cannot watch mm. mine. So suddenly, like you're- one of those massage circles. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah, all yeah. just or a on each other's line, shoulders. Yeah. yeah, and even if you go wow, like a conga line of massaging. Wow, that's a, that's a dream party scenario. <laughs> but how are you watching each other's back in a circle? Because I'm watching your back, you're watching Matt's back, who's watching, and it keeps going around until someone's oh, watching my back. So, you're ste- you're all facing each other. It's Collectively, a conga line you're watching each other's yeah, back. Yeah. It could just c- be a long line. Why does it have to be a circle? Oh, because- Because if I'm the back yeah, of the line, yeah, no one's yeah, watching my back. Watching back. Unless yep. we have a complicated system of mirrors, like we go to like a house of mirrors. <laughs> oh, yeah. House of mirrors could work. Or you could do it or like that. Or a target dressing on, room. You know, in the velodrome- <laughs> Uh, Olympic cycling, that guy at the front always drops off and goes to the yes, back. Yeah. So, yes. someone, if you're not every, you know, they're not watching your back for 10 seconds. Yeah, but, but you're, soon someone will be watching it's your a, back. It's a, you're vulnerable yeah. for that 10 seconds. That's true. That's really, that's going over the top of the trenches, you mm-hmm. know. You're vulnerable. I, you're, in, you're in no man's land. But it also, that's you proving that you're worthy of someone to watch mm. your back soon because you've done it for them. But if I was the enemy- Mm. I would just sit there, picking little sniper the, rifle, yeah, picking, picking them off. At the back. Well, the, yeah. good, the good news is, as you go over the trench, I will be watching your back okay. as you get shot down. <laughs> okay. So, you get, you'll be watched the last second. He died a hero. <laughs> I saw it. Oh, yeah, that does feel nice. As long as you He was shot my, my back b- running away from the battlefield. <laughs> yep, a hero. Hero. <laughs> hero. Look, I got him to sign this statement. <laughs> Saying, I'm a hero and Dave didn't do it. Sounds like it's the old footballer's code in the AFL where- You'd, they'd go to the tribunal and some guy's been knocked out and he's at the tribunal with a broken face and he goes, yeah, no, nah, I didn't feel a thing. Yeah. No, nah, I don't think you did anything. <laughs> they don't really do that anymore. Now they'll be like, he hit me right. <laughs> There's a lot more cameras now too. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. They're like, oh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm absolutely fine. I have wired my jaw shut for other reasons. <laughs> it's fashionable. Yeah. I try to get a more snatched jaw line. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, that's just a bit of context about, like, the the lack of trust that people had in the police at the time as well because a lot – yeah, 19 people in a not-that-long period, 20-year period. And the population's not huge. There's not millions and millions no. and millions of people there. Like, this town or, like, yeah, the, the area it was a population of, like, 7,000 people. Wow. Everyone know- <laughs> Everyone would have known someone who was yeah. wrongly put away. <laughs> Frames. <laughs> so they don't have the best. The police don't have the best reputation. Meanwhile, and- there's one murderer going around doing them all. And he's going, "This is fantastic. This I is love the best this. day ever." <laughs> The best day ever. <laughs> and, then, and then the cops have to be like, wow, a 19th copycat killer, but we got him. <laughs> wow, the people in this town are obsessed with copying this killer. <laughs> the same MO and <in> everything. <laughs> same fingerprint. <laughs> it's, it's what? They're so good. So back to that fateful day, 27th of June, 1999. 
Um, when the night duty officers ended their shift at 6 a.m., they made their way back to police headquarters and handed in their reports to the duty officer. And it was only then, two hours after the crime had first been discovered, that South Wales police realised they were dealing with a serious crime. Because remember, the detective inspector, who spent 10 minutes there, he'd reported a fire but hadn't said anything about the deaths. He didn't pass on the fact that there's four murdered bodies. Nah. Oh, he, actually, he might have said that people died in the fire, but he, but everybody who was at the scene was like, oh, they're, they've been hit, like this blunt tra- um, force trauma to the back of their heads. And he's like, yep, fire. Crazy. Yeah, they must have been backing out of the rooms and just bashed heads on, on the landing, I guess. It happens. Anyway. Gotta go to bed. Uh, Meanwhile, the bodies of the victims were examined and it was determined that the traumatic head injuries were sustained prior to or around the time of death, so they weren't killed in the fire. That was established very quickly. The case landed on the desk of Detective Superintendent Martin Lloyd Evans. In his career spanning more than 30 years, Lloyd Evans had been involved in more than 50 murder investigations and for the eight years prior to this case, he'd been working with the Major Crime Support Unit. The day after the murder, he spoke at a press conference stating, Amanda, a devoted mother, came home with her two children at 12.30am. I need to know what happened after that. Three generations of a family have died and a family have been devastated by this appalling crime. They have been brutally attacked and it is important we get to the bottom of this as soon as possible. And police determined fairly quickly as well that a fiberglass pole type thing was the murder weapon that had been used to kill the family. Friends of the family say it was like a pole that was sort of left behind by a previous tenant and sometimes the Katie and Emily, the little girls, they'd play with it sometimes. It was just sort of something that was in the house. Right. Police also believed that there had actually been two fires lit. They think one around 2.30 a.m., another at four. So this led them to believe that the first fire had been lit shortly after the murders had occurred and then the killer had returned later to set fire to the house to destroy the evidence of their crime. Right, they maybe hadn't gone up quick enough. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, well, that didn't take off. I'll go back and set another fire. Well, they're very, very cold. Yeah. It's so cold, fire can't light. Anyway, so as the police investigation proceeded, they quickly discovered a rather interesting suspect. They discovered that Mandy Power was having a romantic relationship with a woman named Alison Lewis. Alison was a former police officer, a mother of two girls herself, and married to a man named Stephen Lewis. The couple both knew Mandy Power, although Alison insisted her husband did not know of the affair happening between her and Mandy. Now, this is the late 90s. Attitudes towards same-sex relationships were still pretty conservative, and the tabloids had a field day with reporting about a lesbian relationship between Mandy Power and Alison Lewis. Some of the headlines were insane. One of them was Murder Mum's Lesbian Secrets. Another was Mum's Tangled Sex Life Holds Key to Family's Murder. And then the tagline is, Vivacious Mandy Powers, 34, had embarked on a tangled bisexual love life before she was wiped out with her family. Oh, my. You're you're telling me that UK press having outrageous headlines. (laughs) I do not believe that for a second. Yeah, I know. It was a different time, Dave. (laughs) A lot of those were quite clunky too, weren't they? Yeah, Yeah, they're not- I'm struggling to get my head around them. They're not clever. Um. It You're was, not clever, UK tabloids. Okay. Okay. We could do better, but yeah. we won't. No. Because we're better than that. Yeah. We're so good we won't do it at all. That's right. <laughs> um, it was it was noteworthy and tabloids really focused on Alison in the case because it was more dramatic and interesting. So uh, more headlines about her were um, Mandy suspect in hiding from mob and the tagline, Alison did not like lesbian lovers' kids. It's just, oh, just okay. making stuff Isn't up, maybe. true? Lesbian lust for murdered Mandy in the tagline. Alison Lewis and Mandy had three lovemaking sessions in the 36 hours before the brutal Clitter killing. Who's given him this intel? <laughs> no <one. laughs> I'm guessing Alison's not saying, hey, by the way. By the way, we had three lovemaking <laughs> sessions. That's what I call in them. In the 36 hours. Yeah, I, yeah. I keep count. <laughs> yeah. Look, I've got a note down in my diary. Here we go. Yep. This symbol means lovemaking. I need to get milk and I had a lovemaking session. <laughs> this symbol just means boning love free. <laughs> That's right. No love, just fucking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you well, got to keep track of these things. Yeah. Have we, we? I don't know if we've uh, really mentioned how great Mandy Powers is as a name. Mandy Power, so Mandy good. Mandy Power, that so, is so good. good. And they're not using any of that in the headline? Yeah, that's there. That's ready to go. Yeah. Power of love. Power oh. of lesbian love. Power if, of Mandy's lesbian love. Yeah, that's it. See? See how much we're already better at this? 
Fucking UK headlines. Destructive power of, you know. Yeah. yeah it's all sorts of stuff. Yep. But I wouldn't do it. Couldn't no. pay me enough. Unless you would pay me enough. <laughs> How much is enough? Ten bucks? Honestly, I'm for sale. Ten bucks. You got ten bucks on you right now? Nah, but I could transfer you ten bucks. Mm. I don't carry cash. That'd probably be a fee though. Yeah. But that would be on my end. Okay. I don't know why he would be feed for me transferring him money. Well, he's often feed. <laughs> I'm a hungry boy. <laughs> he's often feed. <laughs> I think it made as much sense as you saying, why would he be feed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good point. Good point. I'm sorry I had a go at you for something no. I said. <laughs> um, okay. Right, so they're, they're really focusing on that, on yes. this part, and just getting it as- as many outrageous eye catching headlines exactly as they can. right and and yeah it's it's a really strange one isn't it and it happens all the time with like um murder cases or, or i don't know anything kind of scandalous the media sort of really picks it up and runs with it but often they're sort of focusing on the wrong people or in this case just like they they're only talking about Alison because they were both women. If if Alison was a man, I don't think it would have been such a fuss, you know? Yeah. yeah you're right. I but unless they were like, Alison, uh, Mandy and man have 15 lovemaking sessions yeah, then you'd in be like, 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. He should see a doctor. <laughs> and Guinness was there. <laughs> With a stopwatch. Okay, well done, sir. <laughs> so, we're uh, we thinking, Dave, early on that Alison's husband did it. Or he's got to be a suspect. Well, apparently he didn't know about it. Yeah. Didn't know about why why making- is she having to d- say that, though, if people aren't starting to point the finger? I'm yeah. wondering. Though apparently she didn't like the kids of her, of her partner. Right. So, it could have been her. Could have been. Yeah. Which the good thing about this is someone who's innocent had their life ruined by the papers. <laughs> yeah. 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 All, all these articles, I'm sure, are great for the investigation, for getting to the truth, yeah. for getting to justice. Very helpful. Um, also, it's possible that it's the, the detective who turned up for 10 minutes and then didn't tell anyone. I mean, that, that's suspicious that's to weird, me. That's weird, isn't it? That's weird. Or yeah. it could be this uh, killer that's on the loose, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. It could be somebody I haven't even mentioned Another yet. Another copycat killer. Whoa. That's amazing. And I know some people are going to be like, uh, you're being hypocritical, Matt, having got these papers because you're talking about it on your podcast. But no one's listening to this. That's the difference. Those papers are out in every milk bar. Do you think this podcast is in every milk bar in no. Swansea? No, we're only in every, not. every second milk bar at best. Yeah. yeah. And we're working on that. Okay. Okay. We would love to be in every milk bar in Swansea. Okay? Okay. You the think that's not a big goal of ours? We'd love to be we there. We would love to be oh in every gosh. milk bar. And we've put on the record, next time we're in Swansea, we're going to visit every milk, every milk bar. bar. That's right. And we're going to hand deliver this podcast. <laughs> yeah. We still don't know how this works. No, how does it work? We got a guy. <laughs> and yes, it is. It is. Uh, you're right. Like, we're talking about this story and, uh, you know, that's not really helping that much, I guess. But- it's a, something that happened over 20 years ago, and it's not our job to investigate it. But mm. And the media jumping straight in immediately. It's very unhelpful. Really unhelpful. When um, an investigation's ongoing. Yeah. And, yeah, everything's still so fresh. Yeah. Jeez, it would yeah, it'd be awful. It's a, yeah, it's, it's pretty full on. I think maybe some people in the tabloid industry uh, in the UK, and I would go as far to say in Australia- they have very few scruples mm-hmm. or or they either they have a lot of scruples or no scruples, yeah. depending on what scruples means. Mm-hmm. What's the good one? What's the bad one? <laughs> it's having scruples good. Jeez, you've got no scruples. Is that good or bad? I can't imagine hmm. not having something ever being good. Not having something. Do you know what I mean? Evil bones. Yeah. You don't have an evil bone in your body. Oh, thank God. Wait, no, that's bad. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I, th- I started out confused and I, I, I got I more I made so. it worse. Don't worry, you stuck the landing. <laughs> anyway, scruples, fun word. Scruples. That's, that's my main point. Yeah, that's your main takeaway from this so far. I think having scruples is good. Okay. Yeah. So, you've got scruples? I'm not saying I have scruples. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm saying I'm up for sale. <laughs> Are your scruples ten, up for sale? Just just sent me 10 bucks and I'm scrupulous. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's I've Dave over there. Heaps of scru- scruples. I'm a, I'm made of scruples. Can He's I, up to the freaking eyeballs. Can and you the say stuff. do go on? 
place to go Thank on. Thank you so much. The documentary uh, Murder in the Valleys interviews Alison Lewis, um, who says that all the things that she'd sort of previously been proud about were being used against her. So uh, she had a black belt in karate. She was uh, uh, she played rugby at a really high level. She was previously a police officer herself. Um, all of these things would otherwise be seen as achievements were now seen as reasons that she would be capable of committing the murders. So footage of her in karate classes using sticks or poles were used to show that she has experience brandishing similar weapons. Right. She's got, like, there's video of it. Yeah. Any videos of her I think in so. arson classes? No arson classes. Arson classes. Arson classes. <laughs> arson classes. <laughs> well, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> I might go join just so I can say it. What time does arson class start? <laughs> Sorry, I can't do Wednesdays at eight. That's when I have my arson classes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has to be classes. Yeah, classes. Arson classes. Arson classes. Dave, have a go. Arson classes. <laughs> Sorry, just checking in. Is this is this room for arson classes? <laughs> is this it? It's so fun. Or is that down the hall? Arson classes down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for level one arson classes. Is that here today? Oh, level two. Arson classes. <laughs> It's fun. It is fun. Um, but no, there was no- <laughs> There's no video of that No anyway. video of that. But we know that she did karate. Yep. She ha- and, and used weapons. Yeah, I mean, because she did karate. And she was like quite hard. She was like black belt. Like she's, you know, yeah. she's very good at karate. She was a police officer. She plays rugby, like for Wales, like quite high up. Whoa. Um, for the country. I think so. And they're, they're quite good at rugby. Yeah. So, but all of those things are just like- Essentially hobbies. One of them was that she used to have a career as a police officer, but, like, she just has sporting hobbies and mm. then that's being used against her. Again, probably because it's, like, things that, uh, tip, you know, back then were, like, not ladylike or not they were, like, more masculine hobbies or whatever, so then it's, like, she's strong and could mm. probably kill. It's like, she's what? a witch. <laughs> she's a witch. It's just dumb. If she drowns. She's true. If she flies, she's a witch. She drowned. All right. Next suspect. <laughs> when are we going to find a witch? Um, <laughs> yeah, never the a Welsh witch. police are just. Uh. Hey, good news. Uh, well, the good news is Wales doesn't have any witches. Yeah. The bad news is we lost another one. <laughs> we have drowned a lot of women. <laughs> but if that's the, the price of keeping Wales witch free. Oh, I'm sorry. You want us to just let witches roam mm. about? Didn't think so. So, um, yeah, the the weapons idea, speaking of the murder weapon in Murder in the Valleys, friend and neighbour Louise Pugh um, recalled being at Mandy's house one day when the girls were playing with the fibreglass pole and one of the girls was spinning it on the floor kind of absentmindedly when it hit her sister on the ankle and Mandy was like, t- took it off the girls, asked Louise to get it out of the house. She's like, go put this somewhere else. So Louise took the pole out to the back of the house and placed it in a small gap next to the shed. Um, and this was just like a week or two prior to the pole being used to kill the family. And when asked by a documentary crew if anyone had seen her put the pole there, she said that when she turned around, Alison Lewis was standing in the doorway. So Alison knew where the murder weapon was. Right. But how do we know that she know that she saw it? Because uh, a neighbor said when she put it out by the shed, Alison was there. Gotcha. And she and she sort of looked at it. Yeah, she saw her putting it there. So they obviously don't have this looking after each other's back philosophy. Obviously not. Um, Doesn't this say a lot about the 90s that the kids were playing with a stick? (laughs) (laughs) This is how how I remember it as well. I I did have a couple of dolls, but definitely sticks. Yeah, yeah. Were they trolley poles? And a, and a, um, a, a ball, a hoop. Oh, wow. Yeah. Affluence. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) We had hoop money. Um, So this neighbour, Louise, she's featured in the documentary quite a bit. She was only about 19 when the murders occurred, but she was questioned extensively by police because she was close with Mandy and her family and she lived across the road. And it's quite clear in the documentary who she believes is guilty. Um, Louise recalls there being a time when she and Mandy could see a man standing in the back garden. I think it was late at night. It was just a guy standing in their garden. And another time, a man of the same description was seen at Mandy's front door having a heated argument with her. 
And Louise isn't the only person to have seen this man. That's creepy as shit. Just standing in the backyard looking at the house. Yeah, this guy did it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can wrap this up. He's just standing at night time, standing in the backyard. I might have added night time, but- I think, no, I think I had a night time. Night time. Standing in the backyard looking at the house. Mm-hmm. Oh, daytime's also creepy. Yeah, it's going to be Get hard to- backyard. It's going to be hard to say, like, come around again. No, no, I, I was doing it because I was standing there thinking about a present to buy. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was- just had to look at the house to see what colour the paint I should yeah, have. Yeah, I was measuring the backyard to see what size pool to buy you. Yeah. <laughs> I was standing there measuring it. <laughs> <laughs> Standing with my still, eyes. measuring with my eyes. <laughs> yep. All right. I reckon about three by four. <laughs> three, three by four what? Yep. Uh, <laughs> pool diameters. <laughs> <laughs> three by four pools. Wow. Yep. It's going to be mostly water back here. <laughs> we might have to demolish part of the house. <laughs> it's going to be a big pool house now. Anyway, I was trying to build some suspense. Oh, there, so, 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 we so. went on a. Oh, yeah, I'll do it again. I'll do it yeah, again. do it again. Do it again. And Louise isn't the only person to have seen this man. What? A young woman named Nicola Williams reported to police that she'd been driving along a nearby road at approximately 2.30am on the morning of the murder and had seen a tall man with short, dark hair wearing dark clothing. She specifically mentioned a shiny-looking bomber jacket and he was carrying something in his arms, a parcel or a bag, something of like a reasonable size. Okay. Cooperating with police, Nicola produced an eFit. That's an electronic facial identification technique. It's a computer-based method of producing facial composites. <laughs> Is it like, you know, when you make a character on a Wii Sport? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like it's essentially a, an electronic version of like when um sketch artists sketch out, you know, oh, it had a round face and stuff like that. But it's just electronic. I it's like wonder- Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head. I wonder how accurate those things are because I've looked at your faces a lot over the years. Yeah. But if you just took me into a room with with some, an artist now and I had to describe your face, mm. apart from Matt's beard, I don't know, Jess has got like longish brown hair. I'm turning I- my back to you. We should try that sometime. We should. Like, That'd be really know. fun. <laughs> how how accurate would, would I get? I'm just thinking about Jess's face. No, you are just a blank canvas <laughs> to me. <laughs> I think that actually says more about you than about the credibility of this. Okay, thing. fine. I'm I turning. I'm just, turning around. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? What do I think? Can you? Can you? Could, can you? Could you imagine my face? Yeah, I absolutely can imagine your face. I don't want to describe it because the language I would use would not be very pleasant. <laughs> more fucked. <laughs> no, I said fucked. <laughs> more angular. <laughs> more jarring. <laughs> more disturbing. <laughs> mm, you've drawn his eyes too kindly. <laughs> Make him more chilling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's chilling. <laughs> too far. Too far. <laughs> more horns. <laughs> Anyway, so she produces this e-fit and um, that e-fit produced a face that very, very closely matched a man named Stephen Lewis, Alison Lewis's husband. Whoa. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. Very close. But how is he a very average looking man? And does does that person know Stephen Lewis? Like, uh, No. No. So she she just saw him as some some stranger. I think so, yeah. Saw him a few times being weird. Oh man, this is I mean, I don't want to jump to conclusions if this isn't the guy, but he's really sounding like he could be the guy. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, do you know? I know. Oh. Oh, okay. Um interesting, yeah. Cuz if they don't know and they have described him pretty accurately, that's a bit sus. But again, they've just described a man that was hanging around. Maybe he was just Going for a walk with a parcel. Yeah. Who knows? Getting At 2.30 in the pool. morning. Near the- Just heading away from Mandy's house. Okay. Mm. On the night? Yeah. Or, yeah. Night of the murder. There's going to have to be a pretty big twist here. Or he's the guy. <laughs> or, um, the, or the neighbour is uh, framing him. Ooh, which they like to do in Wales. They love to do that in Wales. That's one thing I know about Wales. <laughs> yeah, one of the- Tom <laughs> Jones, <laughs> Catherine Zeta-Jones and frame jobs. <laughs> The frame of Steve Jobs' dad. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Frame Jobs. <laughs> um, the EFIT wasn't shown to the public. The lead investigator, Martin Lloyd Evans, he didn't think this person was the killer. <laughs> the investigation had shown that the killer had not brought anything with them to the house to use for the murder 
and the sighting of this person was a couple of hours after the murder had occurred. So he's like, well, that's not in the public's interest to release that if it's not them. Is this guy a cop? Yeah. Is he? But the guy's he's uh, protecting? Is he a cop? Yep. Oh, okay. He's oh. not protecting anybody. He's not protecting anybody. He's just saying it's not him. Okay. He's saying it's not this. It's but, not oh, this- but yeah, Stephen Lewis is a police officer, yeah. Oh, oh my God. Okay. okay, knew his wife used to be one, but he well, is one. He is a police officer, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that means he would- didn't do it then. I know, hand over heart. Really? Yeah. Well, because yeah. they uphold the right. Or is that Victorian police? And we know they're squeaky clean. <laughs> they're fine. Do they have, they have a similar probably motto over there? Polls like- the right. Don't be evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Google. But I, they don't, they took sh- that off their I website. shall not be evil. <laughs> yeah. I shall not be evil. I shall have scruples. Or In, not. Unless, because we're not sure what well, that or, is. Or not. What's In brackets, or not. Or not. Depending sh- on which one's the good what's one. What's the good one? <laughs> we could look it up. We haven't bothered. Um. So, yeah, they're like, no, nah, it's not in the public interest to see that e-fit. But- I was the best man at his wedding. I know I this guy. I know. <laughs> Months after the murder, Nicola Williams, the woman who'd seen the man d- and did the e-fit, she was asked to identify him in a police lineup. She picked out Stephen Lewis. <laughs> okay. In court proceedings, the judge told the jury to disregard this, however, because Stephen had an alibi. He was in bed with his wife, Alison, so that's fine. And but- they were both awake. But the jurors were Maybe not- Maybe having a lovemaking session? <laughs> Because otherwise, how would Alison know if, you know, you'd assume they'd be asleep. So they'd probably hold hands all night. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't think about that. Are they they holding hands? She did say that she woke up a couple of times and, like, both times she woke up, he was there. Okay. And one of those times was, like, at four in the morning or something, so. And one of the times she she rolled over and she's like, oh, Stephen, you feel like a sack of potatoes today. (laughs) Not sure why. So, the court said, don't worry about this witness picking out Stephen. It's not him. But the jurors were not told that the e-fit- looked even more like Stephen's identical <laughs> twin, Stuart. <laughs> oh, my God. That there was a, was twist. a twist. <laughs> <laughs> You're shitting me. And that he could not account for his movements that night. I was in bed with my brother and his wife. <laughs> Actually, I lie. Some of his movements were accounted for because Stuart Lewis was the detective inspector who arrived at the murder scene shortly after the murder and oh then left. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> you can't be serious. What? Yep. Holy he shit. was the detective inspector who should have been, uh, you know, the in charge of the crime scene, um, oh who should have locked God. things down, who should have- uh, that the house should have been under police watch. Holy fuck. Um, it certainly should have been reported that um, <laughs> these murders were suspicious, um, but instead he left- Oh and my God. his whereabouts weren't accounted for for about an hour-ish after and that. And so when this e-fit came in that looks exactly like him, he mm-hmm. went, this means nothing. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been this shocked on an episode of Dougal. No. <laughs> that is a sweet reveal. I'm a gog, if I'm using that word right. <laughs> if that's good <laughs> if that's or bad, that- I don't know. Isn't that crazy? Wow. So, Alison and Stephen were both arrested. They spent months as sort of the main suspects. Stuart was also arrested on suspicion of perverting the course of justice. Who's arresting them? (laughs) The other cops. And Alison was arrested as well? Yeah. Well, because they think that- Well, yeah, they they suspected that maybe she had committed the murders or was an accessory to it. Stephen had done it or- So, they just went, we reckon- So, it's related to this. It's related to you so we can arrest you all. We have a, we reckon it's some of you or all of you. Or none of you, maybe, but you, probably not. Yeah. Probably some of you. Mm. You come wow. with us. So, yeah, Stuart's arrested for perverting the course of justice. A police inquiry into his behaviour found he couldn't account for his movements at the time of the murder, although he had been on duty. He didn't write about it in his notebook until two days later, and even then parts of it appeared to have been altered. So, how, how did we get to this point where the court wasn't hearing about uh, the fact that there was a twin and stuff to them getting arrested. What what changed? It, that all ha- that happened. They got arrested first. Oh, okay. This is in part of those court proceedings. They're saying the judge was sort of like, you can't take into consideration the e fit. Why? Because he's got an alibi. Right. And the alibi is I was asleep. Right. Okay. Because they use the e fit for the twin brother that looked exactly like him. Oh, not relevant. No, it wasn't. It wasn't like it wasn't used. 
Okay. My God. Be- is this because the prosecutors sort of, they're all still looking after each other? Is this still in that period of- That's what we're assuming, yeah. Wow. So grim. It was pretty- It was. Pretty mismanaged in the court proceedings, for sure. Right. But they were arrested. They were arrested and questioned. and Maybe they're going to get them. um, From John Morris again. When Stuart Lewis returned to the police station, he reported the fire to a superior officer, but not the murders. In the police station, he made a lengthy private telephone call and was seen feeding numerous coins into a payphone that was located in the public waiting area. Why did Stuart Lewis use a payphone in the public area of the station to make his call when he had a private phone in his office? The telephone in his office would have logged his call. The payphone did not. It was the only phone in the building that he could have used if he didn't want his call to be traced. Interesting. Then maybe he just had too many coins. And he's like, I've got to burn through these. Yeah. Or they're going to expire. Exactly. <laughs> they're going to go off. You know what coins are like. That's why they got the date on the back. <laughs> I've got to use up all these coins. All the mine are gone. I've put them in the bin. <laughs> 1981. That was ages ago. Which, which bin have you put them in? <laughs> I just throw I one bloody over there. thousands of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've been collecting them. Um, they still don't know who that phone call was to, that random phone call he made. Yeah, who would it have been to? Despite the sightings of the Lewis twins, the affair happening between Alison and Mandy, the gaps in Stuart Lewis's night and his strange behaviour, none of the Lewises were charged oh. and were freed from p- the police investigation. Oh. A few- well, they- well, um, uh- it doesn't seem right, but we know these police get results. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. If anyone's going to find the murderer, it's mm. them. Or find a murderer. Yeah. <laughs> or find anyone to call a murderer. Mm. It's them. That's correct. A few weeks after the Lewises were cleared, this is about 18 months after the murder, police interviewed a local labourer, David Morris, who had pre- who had previous criminal charges for robbery and was known in the area as a bit of a loose cannon. Any relation to John Morris? No. But mm. crazy, isn't it? Um, it's his twin. <laughs> But he's a loose cannon, David. Yeah, a little bit. He's just, yeah, he's had some robbery charges and um, he lived in the same area and he was the live-in boyfriend of Mandy Power's best friend, Mandy Jewell. Two Mandys. Hang on. It's the live-in boyfriend of Mandy Jewell. Okay. He was- He was- <laughs> the, li- the phrase live-in yeah. boyfriend. Is- it's- <laughs> it's- it's a partner. I don't, I, don't know. I don't know why, but I th- imagine that he's living in the uh, the walk-in <laughs> robe or something or the, the butler's pantry. Yeah, it's his job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like a live-in right? nanny yeah. has yeah. their own exactly. sort of space. Yeah. That's my live-in boyfriend. Dave? He's there when I ring my little bell. Where do you keep your live-in nanny? <laughs> in a cupboard? <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty big cupboard. It's a walk-in. It's, oh, a, it's okay. a robe. Sorry, I didn't realise it was a walk-in. Wow. You're not just shoving them into a- <laughs> Get in the cupboard! <laughs> um, anyway, so, yes, her the murdered Mandy, awful, sorry. Um, Mandy her, Powers. Mandy Power. Power. Her best friend, Mandy Jewell. Great name as well. I know. Um, but David Morris is Mandy Jewell's boyfriend. Living boyfriend. Partner, whatever. However, um, police were interested in talking to David because of one important piece of evidence, a gold chain found in the power household right where Mandy Power's body was found. David Morris initially denied the chain was his. He said it was the same kind of chain he had. But that's not his specific chain. He had actually lost his a few weeks after the murders, after the mm. chain had broken while he was at work. He said he'd put it in his pocket and forgotten about it, and days later realised it was gone. See, that sounds like that could be a load of shit. But it also, we know this police force frame jobs for fun. They love framing them up. They just got to mm. get. That, they got to get their man. They so don't really care which man. This feels like the kind of thing they might do. Go. Find a chain and go, oh. might plant this. Who knows? In evidence. Forensic testing on the gold chain found no DNA other than Mandy's blood, but they did find brick dust and green paint residue. And Morris worked as a labourer. These little bits of evidence pointed towards him. His favourite colour was green. His favourite colour was green. It did match the cabinets in his kitchen. <laughs> Beautiful cabinets. Um, eventually, he did admit that he had lied about the chain. It was his. Okay. In tapes of his police interview, though, he said he um, he knew he didn't have the best reputation and neither did South Wales police, 
So although he was innocent, he didn't want to admit the chain was his because he didn't want to be linked to the murder. Yeah, you guys frame people all the time. He so genuinely says, like, I don't have the best reputation. Neither does the police. <laughs> Do they start laughing? They're like, yeah. They don't find that funny. They don't <laughs> find that funny, which is interesting. Um, In fact, he'd asked his cousin, Eric Williams, to help him purchase an identical chain so that if the police questioned him, he would have a chain proving the one found at the crimes wasn't his. You know, he could be like, no, mine's right here. Um, But what happened to that chain? He did genuinely lose that one? I don't think think they got a chain, or maybe they did. But he had another reason for not wanting to be linked to Mandy Powell's house that night. So Morris was in a relationship with Mandy Powell's best friend, Mandy Jewell, but he was also having an affair with Mandy Power. Oh, Mandy. Uh, how many lovemaking sessions in 36 <laughs> hours? Incredible. <laughs> I'm so impressed right now. <laughs> She's going for the record. Oh, my God. <laughs> you don't have a love session with Mandy Powers. You strap yourself in <laughs> and feel the G's. <laughs> the police alleged that Morris had gone to her house late at night, drunk and wanting sex, and when she refused, he went mad and killed her and her family, which is pretty extreme. Um, from The Guardian. His own story is very different. He'd been living with Mandy Jewell for seven years, but their relationship was marred by arguments which could turn violent. I mean, you're living in the butler's pantry. Mm. Yeah, it's going to cause strain on your neck and back. (laughs) Where do I sleep? (laughs) Mara said the worst was when she hit him on the head with a piece of wood after she caught me shagging this girl from round the corner. (laughs) I was like, okay. From the start of his clandestine relationship with Power in 1998, he said his biggest fear was that Jewel would find out. When Power began her affair with Alison Lewis, Morris said he did stop seeing her, not because of the intensity of the new lover's feelings for one another, but because he had been banned from driving and could not easily get to her home. (laughs) It wasn't that there was any bad blood between them or anything. He was just like, I just can't get there. It's logistics. Yeah, exactly. Early in 99, however, he insisted they had begun talking again. Um, They'd talk on the phone and they met for coffee. Talk on the landline? On the landline. (laughs) It's harder to have an affair back then, wouldn't it? And there are also, like, phone records that say that, like, she called him a lot. Like, it wasn't, yeah, that, that backed up his story there that they were, they'd talk on the phone and stuff. On the 25th of June, 1999, just two days before the discovery of her body, Morris says he went to Power's house in the morning while the children were at school and had sex. Before he went to her bedroom, he said he left the, his chain, which had a broken clasp, on her kitchen counter. After the murders, the chain assumed a frightening significance. Morris told his cousin, Eric Williams, and he said, like, if I'd murdered her, that is the last thing I'd have done in terms of leaving the chain behind. Months later, that conversation led to Morris becoming a suspect. So it's essentially his cousin that, like, dobbed on him and said it's his chain and he, which isn't good. Um, When he was first arrested, he lied to detectives. Again, he says, because he was scared. So on the night of the murder says Morris. He and Jewel had an argument at the end of an evening in a local pub. He left alone and decided to walk to his parents' home, which was eight miles away or 12 k's, but it started to rain when he was halfway there. So he instead went to the home he and Jewel shared, getting there by 3 a.m., an hour before the killings. Yet, unfortunately, this didn't really give him an alibi because he went to bed in the spare room because they'd had a fight and she slept through it. So she, I think Mandy Jewell said um, she heard she heard him get home and, like, the dogs didn't bark or anything, so she was like, well, that's him because they would have barked at a stranger or anybody else. Um, so she she backs that up, but because she didn't see him, they're like, mm, don't know, can't prove it's definitely him that got home. Right, and also he's not a cop, so we don't believe him. <laughs> we yeah. don't believe him. And he's done robbery in the past, so we assume it's him. That murdered Robbery is the gateway drug for murder. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. But also, um, yeah, no, we didn't see- You didn't see him and, you know, if you had maybe an identikit drawing of him that was very closely uh, represented, uh, resembling him, then maybe we could bring that into evidence. But, but you didn't see him. You don't, so- And that's- So that's the kind of thing we need. <sighs> Unfortunate. Apart from that other one. Thanks, which, for, um, thanks for wasting our time, Mandy yeah. Jewell. We need it every second time. Yes. And this is the second time. Okay. <laughs> so David Morris was um, was arrested and charged and court proceedings went ahead. So the entire case against him is based on a chain that has no DNA evidence on it and his lack of alibi. That's the entire case against him. Surely you can't convict on that. There's no clear motive to commit this horrible crime. But the prosecution told a story of an alcohol and drug fueled psychotic rage. 
Despite no DNA evidence connecting him to the scene, three years after the murder of Doris, Mandy, Katie and Emily, David Morris was convicted of murder and sentenced to a minimum of 32 years in prison. However, another dodgy thing was happening. Morris's solicitor, David Hutchinson, had spent months representing both Lewis brothers Mm. when they were suspects. So the one lawyer is representing all people suspected of this murder. There's only one lawyer in this town? All the others are in jail. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, frame job. (laughs) (laughs) So this was part of the grounds for Morris's appeal. The appeal claimed that... As a result of representing both parties, Hutchinson failed to present evidence which would have been favourable to Morris because he's already, it's, yeah, it's a big- Bit of a conflict. Big old conflict of interest. In a letter to the Court of Appeal, um, Hutchinson denies he had such a conflict, saying he was careful to ensure that Morris was happy about the fact that he'd already represented the Lewis brothers and that he checked with the Law Society's ethics department. By the time Morris was charged, he said he had stopped acting for the Lewises. But the lawyers for Morris's appeal say other important evidence wasn't given by the defence. For example, Stephen Lewis repeatedly insisted he did not know of his wife's affair until after Power's death, yet Hutchinson had the disciplinary report which contained statements from two witnesses saying Stephen had known about it. If these people had been called, they could have backed testimony from Power's neighbour, Louise Pugh, who told the court she had heard Stephen threatening Power in the weeks before the killing, telling her to stay away from my wife or I'll kill you. Okay, and that w- that wasn't allowed in court. No, it wasn't. Um, but it wasn't deemed necessary. No. Or relevant. No. Um, because Stephen Lewis denied that. He's like, no, I didn't. So that's that. <laughs> So Morris's legal team made an appeal, um, but in 2006, David Morris was once again convicted and sentenced to life in prison. That's even more than 32 years. Mm. Morris, depending uh, on how long you live. Yeah. This is like assuming that he didn't do it. What a nightmare. Well, that's it. And and the documentary that I was watching, it does, it's like, it's pretty even. Like it really, it, it investigates sort of both sides, but- I don't know. David's not really mentioned until, like, episode three. Um, And it does tend – it felt to me like it lent a little bit towards David Morris being innocent. It's a really – and I'll get to it. It's a really divisive sort of story in the area. People are really on one camp or the other still. Oh, so no one's ever admitted it. Well, we keep going. Morris's family maintain his innocence and, as I was saying, the murders and David's conviction have been a divisive topic in the area. From Wales Online, some locals still buy into the debunked theory that a former policewoman, her husband and his twin brother carried out the killings. But retired Detective Superintendent Martin Lloyd Evans, who led the investigation, is 100% sure South Wales Police got the right man. He told the TV documentary... (laughs) Which wasn't their man. (laughs) I have no doubt at all that David Morris is the killer. No doubt at all. This case has been looked at and looked at and explored. I am puzzled why people can't see Morris for what he is. Can you imagine anybody saying, I'm the monster that did this? This That is never going to happen. And he does not come across super well on the doco, I have to say. He's in it quite a bit, but he comes across sort of defensive and dismissive. At one point, he's asked about Stephen Lewis and does he think his wife having an affair is motive? And Lloyd Evans kind of goes on a bit of a rant about, of course, of course that's not motive. When have you ever heard of somebody doing that? That's ridiculous. <laughs> okay. And it's like, the fuck are you talking about? Is this satire? What do you mean? Yeah, I think that's one of the classic ones. Yeah. And he's like, what? What a ridiculous Love. question. No. Love's never been a motive. What? Scorned an, lovers. An that's extramarital not affair. <laughs> and he even sort of words it as if, like, a lesbian affair isn't an affair. Like, it's kind of like, why would, why would a guy care- that's about a lesbian that's, affair. That's actually hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was so weird. He does sort of come across like a bit defensive and I'm like, dude, you're not helping yourself here. Anyway, but that could just be my interpretation of it. Wow. Anyway, so yes, it's very divided. The Lewis family claims to have received more than 400 threats from supporters of the Free David Morris campaign. Alison Lewis has interviewed a fair bit. She she comes across pretty well. I I do tend to think- she probably had nothing to do with it. Um, and she also kind of um, sympathises, I guess, with 
David Morris's family. She's like, I can completely understand why they, you know, um, are angry or they're upset or I can understand how hard it must be to hear people say your family did this. She's like, she's quite sympathetic, but at the same time she gets like death threats all the time from people who like like the Facebook page and find her and message her and stuff. And it's like, well, that's not how the law works. Um, So, but she said, how has this happened? And 22 years later, I'm still sat here defending myself, telling people I'm not a murderer when all I wanted to do was love her. Mandy was always kind, loving, tried to do her best all the time and enjoyed her life and her children. She had so much to give and so much to live for. There hasn't been a day when I haven't missed her. I loved being with her and everything about her made me happy. So I tend to sort of feel like she wasn't really involved, but I'm pretty sus in her husband and his identical twin brother. Mm. Unfortunately, David Morris died in prison in August of 2021. Just a few months later, in October, a forensic review of the case material revealed that a blood-stained sock found at the crime scene and believed to have been used in the murder linked Morris to the murder. Oh. The sock identified the presence of DNA that linked him or a male relative on his paternal side to the crime scene. Has he got a twin brother? No, <laughs> not that we know of. It's, um... And it's a weakish link. Oh, okay. I think. It's not open and shut here. Well, that, for some people, was enough to put the case to rest. It was also like a couple of months after he died. Um, the development prompted a rare statement from Mandy's family who called on Morris's supporters to accept his guilt. They said the loss and grief our family went through and continue to go through is heartbreaking and affects so many aspects of, li- of our lives. No family should ever go through what we have and still do. So, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. So, there was sort of like a new um, head of the police and he was he's interviewed in the documentary and he's sort of talking about how like he's aware of the reputation they had and the lack of trust people have in the police. And so, it was important. They got somebody else to do this review. It wasn't them. They're like, we need another police, you know, branch to do it. And the, in the documentary, they're like, and so, is it like a pretty strong like thing of DNA? And he's like, you know, it's not. As strong as if it was a two-week-old case, it's 20 years old, but it's as strong as it possibly could be given how old it is. But also there's a part of me that's like, couldn't it just be his sock? Mm. If they were having sex two days before, couldn't he have left a sock? Yeah. And there's DNA in it because it's his sock? Couldn't that be? Anybody ask that? Why didn't they find it straight away either? Why did it take 20 years to find this sock until just after he died? (laughs) Yeah, mm. it does seem a bit odd. Why was it a prison sock? <laughs> <laughs> Why was the blood tomato sauce? <laughs> yeah, the fact that it's they waited till he couldn't uh, defend it. Couldn't explain his sock. Explain yeah, his sock. there's nobody that could explain it. Oh, I was really hoping there was going to be a, a more a, a cleaner resolution. Well, of this. I mean, in terms of the law, there is. Yeah. You know? They got their man. Exactly. So, since David Morris's death, though, other witnesses from the night of the murder have come forward and given statements. In a 2019 BBC documentary, a former taxi driver told how he'd been driving up a nearby road close to the family home on the night the Power family were killed, and he claimed he spotted two men and called Swansea Central Police Station on two occasions over a fortnight and was told on each occasion he would be contacted by the team investigating the murders but claimed he never was. So, like... um. Further down the track, he was like, oh, I saw two guys that night. And he called to give a helpful tip. And they're like, yeah, 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 we'll call you back. And they never did. They were relatively identical. <laughs> <laughs> Looked very similar. Anyway, a second man, John Allen, also came forward to say he saw a man carrying a bundle that night close to Kelvin Road around 4 a.m. Um, John Allen is interviewed in Murder in the Valleys as well. And he says he is sure the man he saw that night was Stephen Lewis. And the police interviewed John Allen and then were like, no, nah, we can't take his. For They came up with a reason as to why they couldn't. Um, and who was he? Who was John Allen? He was just a, uh, he was like a taxi driver. Right. And he driving. identified the cop twin or the the other guy, other twin? Both cops. They're oh, both yeah. cops. That's right. The husband twin. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he said it was Stephen But Lewis. they were like, no, 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 I can't. So, you're breaking up. Got to go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's all very murky. I was really hoping 
the, well, the, this was going to go that that guy got out when uh, it became clear that the twins did it or or vice versa. Mm. But it sort of still feels like there's doubt about it. Yeah. It does feel, And it, it does feel like, okay, you're the twins. You didn't do it. You, Why try and push away all the evidence? Because that now, in, in hindsight, just makes it look more suspicious, doesn't mm. it? Especially with, the, with their links to the family. Why wouldn't they be- why, why would you not be reporting it as murder straight away? It feels a bit weird to be like- that, that, Well, that's it, yeah. And what he should have done, actually, um, if he was doing his job properly, like I said before, he should have uh, locked down the scene. This, all these steps that should have been taken at the actual scene itself, but he also should have removed himself from the yes, case because totally. of the conflict of interest. That's- professionally what he was supposed to do, knowing that his brother and sister-in-law are friends with Mandy, um, it's not appropriate for him to be on the case. Mm. That's what should have happened, and instead he just fucked off for a bit. And I'm sure at some point- The thing that's hard about writing this report is that it's it's a lot of just like old newspaper articles, which kind of- It's those type of articles that assume you already know a lot of the information, so they don't fill in a lot of gaps. Like and then how to pronounce- Clinic. Clinic <laughs> or a book or um, a documentary. So, there's there's gaps. I'm sure at some point they were sort of like, so, um, Stuart, where'd you go in that hour and a bit that kind of coincides with this crime happening? I'm sure that that must have happened at some point. But, yeah, it, 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 it feels like it never really went anywhere. And sometimes documentaries, you know, they also have their yeah. angles. So, you don't know what bias you're getting. Exactly. Like, they're telling the story. They're leaving things out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Even just, like, e- the way things are edited in a documentary mm. tell you what they think without them saying it. And, yeah, the fact that this um, uh, superintendent comes across really defensive and, um, like, he just- he it, He's sort of like, it's David. It's David Morris. But then uh, in looking at it, I'm like, well, I don't- I, I must have missed the evidence mm. against him. The sock. The sock, sorry, right. yes. And also that thing of like whenever you have like a cab driver or something, 20 years later being like, it was definitely him. Definitely I him. know. A, a man who's been in the paper every day for a, a yeah. couple of years in your town. Yeah. Do you- I don't remember the the face of the taxi guy that you've, been, you've been driven me here, you know, you I might know. forget it quickly. Your, your memories evolve over yes, time totally. and all that sort of stuff. For 20 so. years I know, and I then f- you see this guy in the paper, it's easy to go, yep, yeah, 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 convince yourself that it was mm. that guy. Yeah, exactly right. The, and yeah, but a lot he of this- also did a vlog at the time. so he, <laughs> It's easy. You could just yep. watch the vlog. And I think that as well in the <laughs> interviews with like the neighbour who was a teenager at the time, um, you know, she's got all these really strong memories of it being- Stephen, uh, who was, you know, having an argument with Mandy one time or they reckon it was probably him in the backyard. or But she's also using the exact same language in terms of describing what this man in the backyard was wearing. It's the exact same language as Nicola Williams's description, which it's been so long, Louise has probably heard that description. Right. And it, do you know what I mean? Like it's all, so it's it all gets so- It's impossible now. It gets so muddy. Oh, man. So, the the clinic murder investigation was the largest and most complex homicide probe ever undertaken by the Welsh police force. Owen Phillips, the filmmaker behind uh, Murder in the Valleys, said this. Those sort of things don't really happen in those sorts of communities, close-knit industrial communities. Everybody knows everybody. It's gossipy. So, when it happened, it was like an atom bomb for the whole community and all the surrounding towns and villages because of the brutality and the strangeness. For 12 months, there were no arrests. You can imagine the fear and paranoia that was happening where people were worried about who could have committed these murders. As well as it being an interesting case with extraordinary details, I think there is a legitimate reason for opening this up and looking at it again. One of the difficult things is separating the fact and fiction, the gossip from the truth. Mm. So there's that. And there's yeah, interviews with both families. Like the Morris family are still, they have no trust in the police, which is totally understandable. They were not satisfied with the DNA evidence on the sock. Um, they still maintain that he's innocent. And, but yeah, then on the other flip side, Stuart Lewis has sort of said like his life's kind of ruined. It's been 20 something years and he can't get a job because as soon as somebody Googles him, yeah. he's linked to this murder case. Apart from the family, obviously, who 
who were murdered. Uh, the, there's innocent people, other innocent people yeah. who've had their lives ruined. We just don't we necessarily don't, know who they are. Exactly right. Is it David if, Morris if who's innocent? If it's David Morris who died in jail. Yeah. Oh, it's awful. Yeah. I just, I mean, obviously who knows, but it just, what, what's his, why would he have done that? Yeah, there's no real motive for it. It seemed like it, it's... That's the. I mean, why would anyone have done it? But why would he have done it? Just seems like what's happened where they they say he just lost it. Yeah, but then there was also in the documentary. There's an interview with a guy who sort of knew David Morris, and one time David Morris came in to his house and hit him over the head with something. And the okay. documentary was like, "Why did he do that?" And the guy's like, "That's just what he does." And you're oh, like, okay. "Okay." So, but I don't know. Yeah. Who knows what the reason for that was? I yeah. Seems really oh, it's just really awful. odd. It is. It's, it's really it's awful top to bottom. It's awful and I'm sorry there was no fun resolution. I mean, yeah. Or satisfying. Not it was never going to be fun. No, I don't think it was, I think <laughs> yes. it was unlikely to be fun, but yeah, it's uh it's a wild story. Yeah. I thought you'd enjoy the twist of the identical twin. That twist was was uh George dropping yeah genuinely you looked quite shocked for a while actually was. i was quite proud of that because i was sort of like where do i put this in how do i oh. how do i work this in and i was hoping amazing that neither of you would like call me on why i haven't named the i've named everybody else except the detective inspector and i was just calling him <laughs> detective inspector it's so funny how yeah, it's you, like you that thing paranoid. when you're doing you're doing a surprise party for someone you're like they know oh my they god know. but i'm like who's thinking well there's a surprise party for me yeah. no one's thinking of me. <laughs> i don't usually drive this way home oh my god they know they know <laughs> Yes, but yeah, that was been like I didn't notice that you hadn't named them. Yes, good. And if good. you had have named them, I don't know if I would have noticed that either. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's a pretty. It's a oh man, it is a wild story. It's a great documentary. If it's available anywhere, um, like on any streaming services where you are, Murder in the Valleys. It's called. Came out in twenty twenty two. Um, it's a really interesting four piece. They do a really good job of it. Um, and yeah, John Morris has written the Clitoch Murders: A Miscarriage of Justice. As well. Great wow. resources on it. Wow. No relation. I think. I didn't get that far into the book. <laughs> Maybe he's like, and he was my cousin. But I don't think so. Oh, my God, because it was him or or relatives yeah. down there on the paternal, paternal side, side, which is probably where Morris, Morris comes from. Okay. okay. We blend this right open. <laughs> We've got it. We've got it. We've got you, John Morris. My last, last chapter is a miscarriage of justice because I, I did, did it. it. And I haven't finished the book. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck it. We've got him. <laughs> Turns out he admits it. Um, that's not true. That's not true, John, if you're Just listening. Just wanted to get ahead of that. But yeah, You it's didn't a, write that, John, if you're listening. <laughs> it's a tough it's a tough thing to talk about too, isn't it? Because we can sit here and like I don't know, go, oh, I reckon it was so and so, but like they're people. Yeah, yeah. And they have families and it's it's strange, isn't it? It's an awful, awful thing. Yes. But, but I am sus on the twins. I'm sorry. Mm. I think a lot of people are. But from a legal perspective, they have been cleared yes. and are innocent. From but they were so involved in that process. Yeah. And at such crucial times. And also I think at one point if you, too if you don't want to be uh seen to have been dodgy, that's the whole reason why you you separate yourself from an investigation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. It just why wouldn't you have done that? That would have like you'd know that that's what you should do. Yeah, and so then And if not, even if you're gonna be there don't go, don't go, anyway, I'm knocking off and then not report the murders. Yeah. That's pretty weird. Yeah, you would remove yourself because then people would go, oh, but he, you know, he acknowledged the conflict of interest and removed himself. He acted professionally. Mm. That would look yes. good in your favour. I totally agree, like 99.99%, but I can see the tiny bit where, a bit like the guy, the Morris with the gold chain, where you go, I didn't do it, but I know this looks really bad. Yeah. yeah. Because the, the identikit looks exactly like my twin brother. Yeah. I'm going to do everything I can to try and make, because what on the off chance that we, he gets convicted, and I know he didn't, even though. Yeah. He, yep. So I don't know. And you that, might just panic. Yeah. But do, do, all of that, doesn't that make you think that there's enough uh, reasonable doubt for both sides almost? Yeah. And so David Morris shouldn't have been imprisoned. Yeah. yeah. Which would have also probably not felt good for the, you know, that. Yeah. You, and this. Yeah, for the family, yeah. We know they get results here, so that was never <laughs> on the table. It's an interesting one. But, yeah, at some point I also read that um, that uh, Lloyd Evans, the superintendent I was talking about, he also knew Alison because they worked together. 
many years ago. <laughs> so you're and like, he's the one saying, no, David definitely didn't. Why can't anyone see it? It definitely wasn't my friend. Yeah, yeah. It was David. Why, why would a man, <laughs> his wife's having an affair, right? Why, why would a guy get mad about that? What's the big deal? When's that ever happened? I don't recall I've, any men getting mad. I've never seen it in a book, a film, a television show. Or in my or in day-to-day my work <laughs> as a police officer. Never. That's, cra- that's a stupid. That's crazy. I tell you what doesn't exist in this town, domestic violence. No, <laughs> absolutely not. People keep saying it's a problem. I'm like, where? Show where? me. Where? I haven't seen I'm it. I'm looking up there. <laughs> I'm closing my eyes. I can't see it anywhere. <laughs> but wow. yeah, that's the- um, uh, the twists and turns of the Klidak murders. I'm going to chalk it up as a mystery episode. Yes. yes. We don't know the- Obviously, someone went to jail for it, but we don't know. Yeah. They, they should have. That doesn't seem like the open and shut case. It feels- But that's mainly because Jess left out this really crucial bit of evidence. Because <laughs> I'm creepy. <laughs> um, it sort of also feels like it's a bit too late for- anything really substantial to change this. You know what I mean? Mm. I would love there to be an update and they have rock solid stuff. That does seem to happen when we do these topics. I know. So I'm hoping for it, but it it does feel a little too late because obviously the the family who were at home, who obviously knew what happened, they were killed. David Morris is dead. Who else? Who could tell us what's happened, you Mm. know? Unless unless one of the twins gets, you know, a deathbed confession. Yeah. If they did it, if they didn't do it, they'll- on It would be weird to confess to anything. Yes. I know. If they do a deathbed, I told you, I, I, I ra- swear. maintain my innocence. Yeah. yeah. Well, it wouldn't be block without a murder or a mystery, and we got both. <laughs> oh, there you go. What great value from Bopper today. Um, well, that brings us to everyone's favourite section of the show, uh, where we thank some of our fantastic- Patreon supporters. And if you want to get involved in this, you can go to patreon.com slash do go on pod. And there you can get all sorts of uh, bonuses and rewards. Dave, please list some of these now. <laughs> Bonus episodes. I'm talking 190 plus in the back catalogue at the time of recording. Plus, we put out three new ones every single month. Uh, you can get involved with voting for topics. You can find out about live shows and get discounts before everyone else. You can join the Facebook group, which is a lovely part of the internet. Some say Beautiful. the nicest corner of the internet. And, uh, yeah, we're creeping towards our target of doing a fourth bonus episode each month uh, featuring a D&D campaign. Uh, which Campagna. Ma- Campagna, <laughs> which may be called uh, <laughs> D&D Do Go On. or yep. something else clever. Do Go On and D. Yep. Do Drag On. There's mul- do multi- Dungeon. Do Dungeon. God, there's so much. Do Drag, do drag, on, drag on and Do Dungeon. dungeon. So like many it. options. Like so it. many <laughs> options. Um. But the first thing we like to do is uh, people who sign up on the Sydney Scheinberg level or above get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question, or a brag, or a suggestion, or really whatever they like. And this section actually has a little jingle. Go something like this. Fact, quote, or question. He always remembers the ding. Hmm, she always remembers the sing. Hmm, I always remember that it sounds like Widget the World Watcher. Um, and this week, I'm reading out for, as I do every week. Mm-hmm. And everyone also gets to give themselves a title. First up this week, we've got Nathan Lang. Okay. Executive of looking as if he knows what's going on. Hmm. Glad I've, I've been re- re- relieved of that duty. Yeah. God, you were so good at it too. Uh, yeah. You always looked like you knew very exactly what was going on. convincing. <laughs> He's a very good actor. And uh, yeah, I don't read these out till I read them out. So, uh, that's just Forgiving myself for any sort of fumbles or stumbles. Uh, Nathan writes, long time listener, first time caller. For my first fact, quote, or question, I wanted to share my favorite quote from back in high school, which I wrote at the start of my first notebook right as I started writing comedy for the first time. Like with every teenager who decides they want to be a comedian in high school, my favorite quote was from the late George Carlin. And the quote is, People who see life as anything more than pure entertainment are missing the point. A beautiful quote. Oh, I like that. Beautiful quote. Pure entertainment. Nothing else. Nothing else matters. Oh, yeah, which is a great uh, James Hetfield quote. Um, (laughs) I'm looking up Nathan Lang comedy. Let's see. Let's see how the career is (laughs) going since that quote kicked it off. 
It is also a great quote for a professional entertainer to say, isn't it? <laughs> Justifying yeah. their existence. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. This is the most important thing you could do with your life. And anything else? Uh, dumb. <laughs> Stupid waste of time. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Don't worry about sleeping or eating or Whatever. A family. Entertainment, baby. I think um, this might be a different Nathan Lang, but I think Nathan Lang is a barrister. Oh wow! I mean, you've got to still performing. You got to perform. You got to talk the talk. Yeah, fantastic. And you know, who entertains more than yeah than I've the seen, law? I've seen Rake. Yeah, I'm picturing them all to be <laughs> they're all Rake. Uh, Cleaver Green types. What's that actor's name? Rake. <laughs> Richard Roxburgh. Richard Roxburgh. What a guy! I've uh, also found a Nathan Lang on IMDb. Ooh. Oh. Known for the favourite, Stingers, Neighbours, Blue Healers. Oh, sick. Could this be it? He could be a double threat. I think that I think a lot of people in, like, uh, acting and comedy also are in the law. Yep. Thinking of Sean McAuliffe. Yes. And the list goes on. Yep. Uh, Nathan Lang. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, next one comes from Mr. Justin McCain. <laughs> Plays a silly game. When all the kids on the street, are they like the to same. do the same. Boo! And Justin McCain is connoisseur of dad sneezes. <laughs> oh. oh. Man. <laughs> is it, do you reckon this is a, um, this, there's something about dads sneezing. Yeah. They do it louder than anyone They get else. a real run up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that for dads. <laughs> My dad is the loudest fucking sneezes. <laughs> it's like we're all experiencing the same pollen, dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very loud sneeze too, actually. I got a real dad sneeze on me. <laughs> uh, and Justin McCain also offering a quote writing, Ooh. they call me Dr. Worm. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? I'm Dr. Worm. <laughs> I'm interested in things. I'm not a real doctor, but I am a real worm. I'm an actual worm. I live like a worm. I like to play the drums. I think I'm getting good, but I can handle criticism. I'll show you what I know. And you can tell me if you think I'm getting better at the drums. I'll leave the front unlocked because I can't hear the doorbell. <laughs> Beautiful quote. Beautiful quote. Beautiful I love quote. that. Again, it just sort of makes you think about what matters in life. Mm. <laughs> Being a worm. <laughs> Playing the drums. Yeah. yeah. Leaving your front door unlocked. Whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Justin McCain. Fantastic stuff. Uh, next one comes from Stephen Edmonds, a.k.a. Director of Recursion. Is anyone gonna anyone know what that means? Recursion? No, maybe excursion, recursion. Maybe he'll explain. Incursion. Incursion. That's when people came to you. Yeah, so I'm guessing a recursion is when you go to Sovereign Hill again. Um, all right. So Stephen, who used to always give us uh, recipes, is offering us a quote, three quotes in a row. Can you oh believe it? Oh my god, it? and we don't get quotes that no. often. So this is exciting. I feel inspired. Me too. Let's write a film. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, let's write a film. <laughs> All right, so here is Stephen's quote. That's he always so remembers the ding and he always remembers the sing. And the way to get involved in this one <laughs> is to sign up at the Sydney Scheinberg level or above. And then you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question, a brag, a, or a suggestion, or really whatever you like. You also get to give us or give yourself a title. And I read four of these out each week. First up this week, we've got one from Chris Torres. And I should say, I don't read them out until I read them out. Uh, this is Dave. No, this is fresh news to you, for you and me. So these great, these, so these, these great supporters could put any words in my mouth, Dave. Oh my gosh. And uh, no, I, and I refuse to edit them out. Whatever they say, that's not quite true. But Chris, so far, no one's ever made me say anything too offensive, Dave. <laughs> Except for tongue twisters. They're fun. Oh, yeah. Offensive tongue twisters. Uh, that was Matt Stewart <laughs> with Dave Warnicky, the Marathon Saints episode 413. Wow. Dave, would you believe this? I have no recollection of that. <laughs> Although a lot of that does feel pretty familiar. It's ringing a bell. But, yeah, we, we recorded that bit a good five and a half hours into the session. Yeah, it was five and a half in. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephen, for that. I've so grateful to be sick. <laughs> you would have got up on it by now, though. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm yeah. chipping away at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the last one this week comes from Nathan Damon, uh, who was hanging out with uh, in Perth last month. Nathan, you ought to see Nathan Damon. Yeah. Oh, uh, God, you have a good life. 
the man drives the biggest trucks. Whoa. Like, they're, they're road trains, but they're not street legal. They're only be able to be driven. They're so big that they can't be driven on public roads. He drives them on huge private mine sites. Oh, wow. And he drives them for hours. And he has this routine where he listens to all our podcasts at certain times of the week and stuff while he's in the truck. That's cool. Uh, yeah, so like not street legal. Like they've been lowered so yeah. low. <laughs> they've all got canaries. Yeah. <laughs> they look fucking sick though. And because the NOS is ready to go. The NOS is ready to go and they've got their subwoofer in the back is too big. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, I would love. Do you think I could do that job? Yeah. I love oh, to drive. You could One hand type on your back. Reverse parallel oh, in the road that. track. That'd be so fun. Uh, yeah, I imagine Nathan Damon could park like a, a mini bus in the tightest spot like it was nothing else. But give him a mini Cooper and he's fucked. <laughs> he's like, oh, <laughs> so small. Too his, tiny. His knees are on his chin. He's like, I don't get it. Uh, so Nathan Damon's given himself the title Group Dad Who Wants Ice Cream. Me, uh, me please, me. please. Chocolate. Chip chock chick. <laughs> <laughs> Chip chock chick for me too. <laughs> Because what Matt's trying to say is <laughs> mint choc chip. Mint choc chip. Uh, okay. And that's what I want too. Actually, I've, I'm going to change my order too. I've been getting into coconut lime. Yuck. Mm, that doesn't sound right. Unbelievably I mean, I good. I can understand it would be beautiful. I don't like coconut. Oh, I do. So like you coconut. can have that and don't get it on mine. But do you like lime? Yeah. Then you love it. Can we wrap it with some dark chocolate? <laughs> What's wrong with you today? <laughs> okay, we've got to check in. Okay. You can't some, go off script. Some dark chocolate? <laughs> mint chocolate. <laughs> Chick up. Am I okay? Check the rip. Someone check my Top it. You feeling okay? Is everything all right, mate? <laughs> I don't know. We talk for a living. Chip, 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 chip. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, We're Nathan, not done yet. <laughs> Nathan breaking the pattern here, offering a fact. Okay. And the fact is, oh, it's road train related. Hooray! Most of the road trains I drive have ninety-eight wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Are there a couple of spares at least? Yeah, there's spares. Oh, steering wheel. <laughs> oh, 99 <laughs> wheels. 99. And what else? what else? What else? What else? Maybe one spare. He's, he eats a wagon wheel for lunch. Yes, that's 100. Uh, he says, pause while Jess loses her shit. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it is upsetting. It's so many fucking but, wheels too. But he does say, now to appease Jess, those wheels are mounted on 25 axles equaling 50 hubs. At this point, while Jess is breathing again, the nerd Dave is probably thinking the math doesn't add up. Is that what you're thinking, Dave? Yeah. 50 for 90, eh? What are we meant to believe that there's some sort of extra axle just hanging out with no wheel on it? D Dave's thing. Just oh, like, Ty, what the fuck? Get out of Dave's head. <laughs> uh, well, the wheels are mounted two per hub except for the steers, which are singles. Okay. So, when Matt carries the one, it works out. <laughs> Carry the one. <laughs> Does that work out? Nathan Damon knows us a little too well. <laughs> oh, wow. And so I love it. Trust me. Now, to make Jess really ha happy, each hub has 10 wheel nuts, giving us a grand total of 500 wheel nuts on each road train. Okay. We do have other trucks with more or less wheels, but my head hurt after working that much out. Anyway, keep doing what you do and love you all. Hey, love you too, Nathan Damon. How many flat tires do you need before you've really got to like get in there? Oh yeah, if you lose one, do you bother changing it? Just like just drag it along, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Can we do a fact quote or question to you, Nathan? Yeah, yeah I've got so many questions. How got a would question. you change? Like they must be so heavy. How would you change the tire? Yeah, especially if you're out, out in the mine site in the desert somewhere. Fuck. You lost the tire. You got to get out there and dig it out. Or it sounds awesome. Do you have to climb a big ladder to get into the truck? I'm oh, so man. excited what, by this. Do you ever sleep in that little back bit? Oh. I'm obsessed with those little. Yeah, imagine it'll be huge in this one. <laughs> I think I found a new <laughs> it's passion. A <laughs> it's like my apartment. Um, I think I found a new passion. Yeah. Road trains. I think I love trucks. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on trucking. Can you take us all out someday, Nathan? I want to have a go. <laughs> That's so fun. That oh, it's probably cool. a manual. I have to learn to drive manual. Thank you so much to Nathan, Stephen, Justin, Nathan. What a diverse group it was today. <laughs> uh, and that brings us to the next thing we like to do is thank a few of our other fantastic supporters. Jess normally comes up with a bit of a game for this based on the topic of the day. Yes. Um, uh, so what we're going to do is we are, <laughs> we are going to. <laughs> it's tricky. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. 
We're going. What about? Oh, no! Nah, it all feels insensitive, doesn't it? I was going to say like what they left behind at a crime scene. Like it doesn't have to it be a murder. Be murder. Crime. It's not a murder scene. Yeah. yeah, just a crime scene. What are they left behind? What, yeah, what yeah. are they left behind a crime scene that they didn't commit? It's just yes, it's just circumstantial. Them yeah, going. Yeah, they've left something. Fuck! Behind. I've left this. What did their twin allegedly cover up? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we'll go with your one. Um, <laughs> All right, if I can kick us off, I'm going to go with from Latham in the Australian Capital Territory. Thank you so much to Jessica Yo. Jessica Yo left behind her spoon collection. Oh, from all, all of them, all 148 spoons, like travel spoons. I mean, you know, like the little souvenir spoons. Yeah, exactly. She'd been travel all- spoons, not little fold up spoons. They've <laughs> so been all over the world, collected 148 spoons, and then accidentally left them at the scene of a bank robbery. Jessica, yeah, you couldn't have found two more spoons. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of them. She was she was stopping for to get some cash out to go buy two more spoons. Oh. Yeah, then left the whole collection, and then the cops went. Well, I mean, ours now. Yeah. They're corrupt. Did, did you commit this robbery? It really feels like you leave such a key piece of evidence feels like a frame job to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to Jessica. I'd also love to thank from North Saanich in mm. British Columbia in Canada. I believe this might be Vancouver Island because Diana Chomack uh, gave a great who knew it question recently. Oh, Diana's a biologist and she sent me a bunch of butterfly ones. Oh, that's nice. And the, the the real one on this episode a few weeks back, probably a month ago, was <laughs> uh was ma- uh, no, it was pomegranate playboy. <laughs> that's was a, a butterfly. Real a butterfly. real butterfly. That's oh, incredible. Oh, Zamet and Dusha were on and they went, Well that's not the real one <laughs> like straight away. <laughs> and then spent ages dissecting the others, but it was yeah. Anyway. Um Diana Chomack. Oh, it's not even a good-looking no, butterfly. No, no, it does not it live up. It looks like a moth. It's boring. doesn't live up to the oh, name at that's all. That's why they tried to zhuzh it up a bit, mm. give it a rebrand. Pomegranate, a fun, you know, a burst of flavour. Yeah. Playboy, sexy. Yeah, yeah. Wearing on the a- the fucking most boring butterfly. Smoking a pipe or yes. something? Yes. <laughs> so, so maybe Diana could have some sort of, uh, some butterfly related or- Like a big net. Oh, a big net. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> not a big net. <laughs> What's the craft scene? There's <laughs> <laughs> a, a Grand Theft Auto. Someone stole a car. <laughs> There's a big net in it. And somehow she left a big like net a, in the car. It's huge. I li- I'd like to think that uh, Dan is like, oh, my God, he knows my profession so well. <laughs> a big net. We all carry around a big net. Do. Big net. Like it's, a- like, it's so big they had to put the back seats down <laughs> to fit it in. It's that big. It's a big net. Thank you so much, Diana. <laughs> and finally, from me, I'd love to thank from West Alice from WI, maybe Wisconsin mm. in the United States. It's PJ Moody. PJ Moody, great name. PJ B. Moody. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like, to me, that that screams real estate agent. PJ yeah. Moody? Yeah. I'm, but not no, going I'm, to, I'm not going to PJ Moody. I for trust my- PJ Moody. Yeah. I don't. But I'm thinking, I'm thinking <laughs> of, I'm probably just thinking that because of AJ Hooker. AJ Hooker, you're the best. LJ Hooker, you're the best. I'm thinking of our editor, AJ. And then it would go, thank the you, Mr. Hooker. Thank you, Mr. Hooker. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we'd snicker. <laughs> oh, we would. Um, that means something else. <laughs> a rugby uh, union position. Yeah, an important one. Mm. I don't know what the hooker does. Um, PJ Moody. PJ Moody has left behind... His contact lenses. Oh, my God. Oh, no. They're They're always bloody losing those things. Yeah. Disposable or not? Uh, Can you get ones that aren't disposable? mm, Yep. And yep. Okay. Wow. (laughs) Double yep. (laughs) So, yeah. And and PJ can't find- I can't see anything now. Mm. That's that's, that's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. We've got to assume that their name is short for Pajama Moody, right? I assume. Pajama Moody. Pajama Moody. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's more like a, or they're more like a Peter Alexander type. Right. Moody Pajamas. Moody Pajamas. Peter Alexander known for muted colours. Mm. <laughs> Very moody pajamas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely don't do Christmas sets that you could also get one for your dog. <laughs> for your moody dog. For your moody dog. Well, yeah. I think that's that was the gap in the market that yeah. Peter Alexander left open yeah. for PJ Moody PJ to Moody. step right into. <laughs> 
Do you want to thank some for us, Papa? I would love to. May I please thank from Garden City Park in New York. That sounds, sounds so beautiful. Beautiful. We'd love to thank Megan McCaffrey. Megan left behind uh, their signed copy of The Lord of the Rings. Whoa! And signed by who? Um, by Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Megan had written their name on the front page. So it's very difficult to yeah, say this isn't mine. mine. Isn't that that's this your name? This book is owned by <laughs> Megan. <laughs> With your name and address and then you've, your you've signature is there. It. Yeah. And then you've put your fingerprint on it. <laughs> I think. Why are you? You've got to look after your books This is not better. looking good for you, Megan, which we know <laughs> Megan didn't do it. No, yeah. we know Megan didn't do it. But it doesn't look good, does it? Well, I said it wasn't my book because I knew that you would draw conclusions. But I just to happened to leave. library murder. <laughs> I just happened to leave my book here. Mm. Can I have it back? Please. I was only halfway through. It's a signed copy. <laughs> what happens next? <laughs> it's very valuable to no one. Um, thank you, Megan. I would also love to thank from, oh, we can only assume, deep within the Fortress of the Moles. <gasps> Location unknown. Mm. Oh, my God. Daniel H. Daniel H. Ooh, what does the H stand for? Mole. <laughs> wow. The Sol- H is silent. Sol- <laughs> Mole. 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 Daniel uh, Dan- left behind a hook. A hook. Wow. Has a hook for a hand. Yes. Left it behind. Left it behind. That's unfortunate. Which hand? Uh, dominant hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. Left. Oh, the dominant hook. Left behind his hook. Left behind the dominant. Left behind the left hook. Oh, that's disappointing. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, it, yeah, it doesn't and look good. Doesn't look good because it was at a. Um, Jack the a Ripper. Hook, a hook massacre. So. <laughs> so it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. But as we said, Daniel didn't, didn't do, do it. it. It's it just a frame job. It just a, it's a frame this job. A frame oh. job. They arrested a, a, a man. He's yelled, it wasn't me. It was the one of man. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Fugitive. Good, good, good <laughs> movie. Good TV show. <laughs> so thank you, Daniel. And um, good luck in the upcoming case. <laughs> Because you're going to need a lot of luck, my friend. <laughs> but we believe you. <laughs> we believe you. No um, doubt about it. And I would also love to thank- Now, help me with this, please. Is this Denmark? No. This is, this is Denmark. Denmark? I, I believe it is Denmark. Sick. What, have a go at that, do you reckon? From Copenhagen. Because when the O's crossed out, I think it means silent. We it would say Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Oh, so cool. Um, thank you so much. I would love to, love to thank Hannah. Hannah Seven. Hannah Seven. <laughs> this is the Seven is silent. Mm-hmm. Oh, apologies. <laughs> Hannah Seven. Hannah left behind. Well, we know we've got quite a close tie uh, with Copenhagen and, and Denmark with our Prince Mary. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> God, we love our Mary. We oh, love our Mary. We went on a little river cruise and they pointed to, that. that that's where she lives. And I, so, you know, and she didn't invite me in. So offensive. Victoria, we gave her a tram. We gave Did them. We? we gave them a tram for as a wedding present. Did we? I think either Victoria or oh, Melbourne yeah, did. Oh yeah, that's an old cute. an old tram. What do they Ima- do with it? Imagine what a burden we've given them. Oh, my, what do you do with it? Scrap metal. I've seen videos because her kids are all sort of like teenagers now. I've seen videos of them just like roasting her because, like, she speaks Danish, but like it's obviously not her first language. So they're always like, "Yeah, mum says stuff wrong." It's oh, pretty funny. <laughs> Pizzeria, razor blades. <laughs> you, no. know you know what she's like. Oh my god, she sounds so funny. <laughs> how do we say no again? No, no, no. Yeah, that's how we all say it every time. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, mum, please, can I go out for the afternoon? She's like, no. no. <laughs> Bit of fun. Hey, I'd love to thank some people now. Did we say something for Hannah? Oh, what's Hannah left behind? So we just- Well, a tram. Tram. A tram. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty- It's a, uh, Like- <laughs> <laughs> Hannah arrives with this tram. Everyone sees it. Yeah. It's a big forklift that she needs what are you delivering thinking? it on. Uh, and then uh, you forget it? How do you forget a tram? And then you're like, oh, she's patting her pockets. Yeah. Oh, keys, I knew I got something. wallet, phone. Tram. The tram. The tram. tram. Oh, forgot to tap on on my own tram. By the time Hannah goes back for it, everyone's dead. Yeah. Because they were run over by the tram. <laughs> Again, not her fault. Landed on the witch's feet are just poking out. <laughs> okay, now you can thank some people. I've Dave. looked up uh, Copenhagen. So I typed it into Google and it just says, get there. And we can be there in a short 23 hours and 30 minutes. Oh. So. Within a day. See you tomorrow. Within a day. That's good news. <laughs> a 
That's less than a day's travel. God, you're a glass half full kind of guy. I love it. I would like to thank from Willoughby in Ohio. Oh, my God. God's country itself. Big shout out to Phase 4 or Phase 1V or Phase IV. Phase 4? I'm going to go for IV. Phase IV. Phase IV. Um, phase 4. I really hope that when this episode goes out that this doesn't trigger something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Phase four. <laughs> and then the robots <laughs> uprising happens. They're waiting for someone to say <laughs> phase if. Because <laughs> oh they're like, no one would ever say that. That sounds stupid. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So make that the code word. Mm. Nobody would ever think that would be how you'd pronounce that. Uh, phase four from Willoughby. What is phase left behind? Uh, lightsaber. Mm. Wow. Like, do they get it for, like, from the set of Star Wars? No, it's like a, it's like a real one. It's like a legit Oh, my one, God. Dave. Don't tell me they left it at the crime scene where people were killed with yeah. a lightsaber. Yeah. That is unfortunate. It's, no, no, they weren't killed with a lightsaber. They were killed with a kyber crystal to the face. <laughs> Someone threw the kyber crystal, <laughs> which I think is what powers a lightsaber. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Who, who wow. am I talking to? Have I become the nerd? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was the nerdiest thing you've ever said. Oh, my God, you freaking nerd. <laughs> Oh, I hope I got it right. I've never been so unattractive to you. (laughs) A new low. A new low. We didn't think we could get there, but- (laughs) But you're saying that they threw the handle at someone's face? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Whatever the thing, I believe a kyber crystal is important to it. I believe you. And it's just like, it's like a rock and they just, they took, they didn't know how to work it. So, they just picked out the rock and they chucked it at them. Like in any action movie where they shoot shoot through the clip in the gun and they go, oh, whatever, and just throw it at the person. Love that. Love that. Love that trope. I'd love to get a montage actually of people throwing their guns. Yes. Did someone do that? I can't be bothered, but I want to see it. (laughs) I'll I'll watch the shit out of it. Phase four, could you put that together? Is that something you would do? Is that phase five? (laughs) Let me know. <laughs> Let me know. Let me know. Let me know. Love you. <laughs> Love you. Thanks. Bye. Oh, that's what. Okay. <laughs> next up, I would like to thank. So I was just looking at what the next one is because it's written as from Bruce TWP. Oh, that's a place. In Michigan. I'd love to live in Bruce. It's Bruce Township. Oh, my God. Oh. It stands for, which I love so much. Holy shit. That is right up there with Gary. Wow. Bruce I love it. Township? Bruce. And you know what comes up when you f- first Google it on uh, maps? Blake's Orchard and Cider Mill. Ah. That sounds beautiful. All right. It's on the list. When we end up on this tour, can we go to Bruce? Add it to the list. I think I'll be in America right now as this episode comes out. Is That's that- exciting. Wow. What are you doing? Maybe I'll be in Bruce. <laughs> You'll be in Bruce. The largely- But rural- in Vegas. <laughs> the largely rural township, I- rural township is home to the Ford Motor Company Proving Grounds. Oh, oh great. That's and a it's baking also thing. home to- Oh, it's also home <laughs> to- Sorry, I got so distracted by Bruce there. Sawyer Hall. That's a great okay, name. you've definitely switched things around. I think Bruce is from Sawyer Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Sawyer. Sawyer Hall. Sawyer. Sawyer. Water. Sawyer. Tom Sawyer. <laughs> Water. <laughs> that vocal fry you had Water. with an American Tom accent Sawyer. is so good. I've learned all of my American accents from- Busy PB- Phillips. P- and, and PBS podcasts. Oh, yeah. Or whatever they're called. What do they call them? <clears throat> this American Life. Oh. This American Life. <laughs> I don't think that's how they talk. <laughs> that's how they talk. That's, that's the, the surfing edition. <laughs> so, uh, Sawyer Hall has left behind left a behind. rowing oar. Oh, why? Uh, they were just carrying it. Okay. And then, you know, explosions started going off, so they dropped it. Of course. Ran. Yeah. But uh, it does look a little bit suspicious now. Yeah. Wow. Because it's just an oar. Yeah. And people are like, why do you have that in the city? Yeah. It's and weird like, to have in Bruce Township. Oh, it's fucking none of your business. None of your business. And then because of that attitude, they keep saying none of your business. Rather than no comment, they say none of your business. <laughs> it makes them look guilty. Yeah. Honestly, Sawyer, just say no comment. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know who, I don't know who Sawyer's lawyer is, but they're terrible. Sawyer's lawyer. Sawyer's lawyer sucks. <laughs> but on your Sawyer. And finally, <laughs> I would like to thank all the way from Eland, Wisconsin. <sighs> Big shout out to Ava. 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 Ava has left behind. Uh, well, let's do one of the, the three ways. Yes. Okay. Let's do a three-way. Let's do a three-way. Let's okay, do a three-way. Even we'll though we've pause been- here. Mm-hmm. Never we'll been- have a three-way, then we'll come back and we'll finish Even this show. Even though we've never been less attracted to you, we will still <laughs> Thank try you. and get it done. We've never well, been less attracted to this you. Way, this, this way, I'll look at your backs. 
Okay. So you don't have to look at me then. <laughs> Just trying to look at what- We're what, getting a circle. What we're doing- We're getting a semi-circle. If you're looking at our backs, that's- I'm in a semi- Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Get that image out of my mind. Well, you can look at my back if you like. <laughs> you're, feel- you're looking at the wall. <laughs> I feel sick. <laughs> Okay, what, is it a word at a time? All right. And it's an object. <laughs> All right, I'll finish it off. Okay. You're going to finish this off? The, the, <laughs> yeah, I'll, the, finish it, I'll finish off, then I'll what come back. What's happened? All right, and we're back. Um, that was fantastic. Okay. <laughs> now for, let's- for some. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm just, I think, I think I had a good time. That was a bit of fun. Um, what a what a great love, <laughs> love, love session. Making love session. making session that was. Mm. <laughs> this is awful. Um, yeah. Apologise to anyone eating their uh, cornflakes <laughs> or <laughs> spitting across the room. Mm. All right. Fl- 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 flange. <laughs> I haven't given you. All right. Gr- green. Saucepan. <laughs> flange. <laughs> We've never been closer <laughs> after that quick break we had. <laughs> green sauce. <laughs> wow, you ever left behind a green mm-hmm. sauce of flange? And there's questions from the cops mainly. What the fuck is this? <laughs> <What> is this? <laughs> I was like, it's a new invention. Actually, it's, it's a great sauce with flange. <laughs> oh, if you have to ask. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you so much. So, I have a Sawyer Phase 4, Hannah 7, Daniel, Megan, or Megan, PJ, Diana, and Jessica. And the last thing we need to do is welcome a few people into the Triptych Club. Uh, this is a very exclusive club where people who've been signed up on the shout out level or above for three straight years uh, get shouted out. They get welcomed into this club. Uh, they're allowed to come in, they're not allowed to leave. Uh, it's like a one way flange. What is a flange again? Anyway, so- I think it's a thing. <laughs> a fruit flange. Something you- It's a dessert. <laughs> <laughs> that's a- No, it's a- It's like a- I can't describe it, but it's like a little- A little thing. Like a- Anyway, so- um, People who have been signed up for three years straight- Used to connect pipes with each other? Yes, there we go. Mm-hmm. And they- um. <laughs> <laughs> and we always are welcoming it, you know, them in. It's a bit of theatre of the mind. I'm standing at the door, got a velvet rope. I lift, lift it, call out their name. Dave's on stage. He's hyping them up. Jess is hyping Dave up. Mm-hmm. Dave does the hyping with a bit of weak word play. Jess is behind the bar as well. Normally comes up with a little treat. Yep. We've got the um, Welsh cakes and Welsh whiskey. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. fantastic. What a combo. What a beautiful combo. Breakfast of Champions. And Dave, you normally book a band. You're never going to believe it. What? I have been trying to get this band in for a long time. One of my all-time favourite bands, all the way from Wales. What? Super Furry Animals are here tonight. Oh, my God. I didn't brush my hair. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. So, are we ready to go? Ready. It's quite a few, Dave. I'm ready to hide Oh, my gosh. How many were there? Nine. We got nine. Here we go. Nine. Feeling fine. Sorry, just warming up here. (laughs) Okay. He's on already. He's hot. Let's go. From Tacoma in Washington in the United States, it's Sarah Castaneda. Well, let me welcome you in with some castanets. <laughs> From Olympia, also in Washington in the US, it's Catherine Conrad. We're putting the rat in Conrad. Yeah. It's Catherine. Woo! Uh, from address unknown, can only assume from somewhere deep within the fortress of the moles, it is Cube. <laughs> Uh, looks like based on their email, their initials are MK. MK. My kind friend, Cube. Cube, my dude. <laughs> yeah, Cube. But I was going to say before you said the, the MK, which I obviously had to work something in there. I was going to say something like, um, uh, I love you on all sides. Like, oh, oh, yeah. That's so good. MK, you're <laughs> ultra, <laughs> ultra so competitive uh, for my affection. <laughs> um, from <laughs> Shut the hell up. <laughs> from Smithfield in North Carolina. Quick fun fact. That is where Venus Fly traps are from. Not fun. In the United States, <laughs> please welcome into the club. It's Brian Siddle or Seidel. Brian Seidel. Oh, the night was starting to idle, but then Brian Seidel Ooh! came along. Really got, got us up a gear. Let me sidle on up next to you and get you a drink. <laughs> from <laughs> West Valley City in Utah in the US, please welcome in Ben Robinson. Oh, West Valley City, born and raised. Ben Robinson, here for a day. Woo! <laughs> oh, also, 10 out of Ben. 
Whatever. Yeah. Ben out of 10. <laughs> Whatever. From address unknown, can only assume as well, deep from in the fortress of the moles, it's David. Takes one to no one. David! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, da- David. I'm just I'm I'm wary of uh, not um, outing anyone's full names if they've written a partial ones on purpose. But yep. his email address uh, surname <laughs> is with a P. <laughs> his email address his email is, email address is <laughs> so, d so dot p. A- D- Dave's already done it and he's nailed it. Well, I'm just making sure that David knows who we're talking okay, about because he's from right. the Fortress of the Moles. Yeah, yeah. it's just David. Yeah. David. A boring name so, that anybody could have. You know, it's David. The David. Yeah. <laughs> Big shout out. David P. P. Uh, Great. Thank you so much. Also from deep within the Fortress of the Moles, please welcome in. I don't think I'll need to give any more info because <laughs> I think they'll know who they are. It's Tambalonius. Tambalonius Monk. Like, yes. the, like the jazz guy, yeah, Thelonious yeah. Monk. The, yeah. And then- uh, uh, Getting funky with uh, Tambalonious Monk. E. Okay. Woo! Yeah. Okay. Well, feel the funk with Tambalonious Monk. There, there it you is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, please Tumble welcome in from great. Cork in Ireland. It's- Kean. Kean Griffin. <laughs> I know. I love how you knew that I was my, what my eyes were asking. <laughs> Kian, always a pleasure to see him. Oh, <laughs> that's good. And finally, from Bendigo here in Victoria, it's Matt Allen. <laughs> Matt Allen. Um, Some of the key. You're the key to my heart. You're the Allen key to my. Oh, you're the oh, Allen. That's sorry. That's obviously great. It takes from Matt to know Matt, and uh, you're the key to my Allen <laughs> heart. That is good. Uh, welcome, uh-huh. <laughs> Allen. <laughs> Welcome into the club, Matt. Must try stand up. Welcome into the club, Matt, Key and Tablonius, David, Ben, Brian, Cube, Catherine, and Sarah. Yes. Or Sarah. Uh, that brings us to the end of the episode. Anything we need to tell people before we wrap this up? That we love them, that they can suggest a topic. Anytime. And all of these topics through Block are things that have been suggested um, to us and then voted on by our listeners. So you don't have to be a Patreon to suggest a topic. You can just do it. And There's- it's incredible to think with this episode. Only one person suggested it, and mm. still, you can still, you can be the only one in the world to think of a block worthy topic. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't normally happen. No. Usually we're reading out a bunch of names at the So incredible. Suggested Pretty amazing. Stage. So, yeah, there's a link in our show notes, and you can also um, go to our website, which is dogoonpod.com. You can find info about live shows there, suggest a topic, um, buy some merch, whatever you want to do. And you can follow us on social media at dogoonpod. Davey, boot at home. Hey, we'll be back next week with another fantastic episode. That's my guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> but until then, also, thank you so much for listening and goodbye. Later. Bye. Why are you waving? We've got a camera in here now. Hi. A security camera. <laughs> <laughs>